Welcome everybody from all over the world to uh, this uh, inaugural webinar, which has been brought about mainly due to COVID, obviously, and our inability to get people together for, for seminars and conferences. But we're finding that this has been very effective in other formats. So we're hoping that you will all get something out of this. Um, there will be several more of these. If you go to our ICF website, you'll see all the different topics that are going to be covered in the coming weeks. So you can register for as many as you like. Um, and we'll have a variety of panelists to pass on their expertise to you. Uh, we're very, very fortunate today to have Zoltan Bakemo as our presenter. Pretty well all of you will be familiar with Zoltan. He's a five times world champion. He's an Olympic bronze medalist. Uh, and he's had more than 30 years experience at coaching and he's coached countries like uh, his native Hungary, of course, uh, Norway, Brazil, Denmark. Uh, he's also lectured in coaching and done a lot, a lot of work on uh, and study on the, the finer forms of coaching. And there are few people in the world at the moment who have sharper minds when it comes to topics of coaching and how best to, uh, to get the best out of athletes. And Zoltan. So we are very, very, very fortunate to have him with us. As I said, if you have questions for Zoltan, please go to the Q&A tab at the bottom of the screen, click on there and type your question in. Um, and then if you see a question there that you like, that you want asked, please just like it. And it will, uh, the more likes it gets, the more chances it will have of being asked at the end. So without further ado, uh, we have about one hour. So I'm going to hand over to Zoltan now for his presentation. I hope you all enjoy this and I'll be back with you at the, uh, at the end of the presentation. Zoltan, over to you. Thank you, Russ. Uh, welcome everybody from the sunny Copenhagen at the first official ICF webinar. It's a great honor for me to be the first presenter in this development program. And as Russ was talking, uh, so I can see the statistics. We have a huge numbers of visitors around the world today, 65 countries from every continent. And uh, I'm just missing Antarctica in a way, but representing different levels of involvements of our sports. Um, this year we had to go through a lot of difficulties due to the COVID-19 virus postponed domestic international competitions, championships, and postponed the, the main competition, the Olympics in Tokyo. So we literally lost a season we were preparing for four years. Uh, in the same time, unfortunately, we lost the personal contacts uh, with each other and in training camps, competitions, meeting with the rival competitors, meeting with old friends. But fortunately, thanks to the internet, we have the opportunity to meet. And I hope today's webinar will also keep, can help keeping together the kayak canoe society in the world. So let's get to the, uh, the topic, today's topic which is um, uh, the difference between women and men training methods. So I can say that my experience, it can be a short answer, but <clears throat> I think it's good to try to open up and see what are the small details. So we coaches, another scientist, I mean daily practicing coaches, but we must have the knowledge and understanding about the human body to create the best possible training programs for our athletes. So there are some very important aspects need to be considered in the design of a training plan. So these aspects are the following. The gender of the athlete. The next one is the age of the athletes. If they are beginners, advanced top athletes. Uh, the next one is the, the physical parameters. Let's say we have to take an account into the inherited skills, many other things. The next one is the competition specifications. 
So if you're talking about sprint or marathon distances, that's also determining the training programs. Also, we have to take into account the, the fitness status, like the training history, where the athletes coming from, where they are going. Also need to take into the account the season cycles. Some of the countries they have, like uh, basically Europe, they have uh, one season from beginning from October and goes up to the next August, like one tapering season. Um, some other countries like Australia, New Zealand, they have mostly like two seasons, like one season is because they have the opposite weather conditions. So they have the summer season up to end of February. And then they have another one when they move over to, to Europe or to the place where we going to held the main competitions. So we have to take an account that one also. Um, next, please, Seba. As we can see that among all of the small mark differences is the gender. It's well known that a man and a woman have markedly different psychology, uh, physiology, sorry. There are significant sex differences in the endocrine, cardiovascular, and other systems. It would be a mistake to ignore the physiological differences when we design the training program. So in this following article, I will try to highlight some of the key differences in order to create more effective programs for both male and female athletes. Next, please. Now we can see a table about just in essence of the sex specific differences which affect the trainings. So we can see here on the left side, the men, they have more type two fibers. The women, they have more type one fibers like slow twitches. The men, they have greater power output. The, in the same time, the, the women, they have more fatigue res resistant. Uh, the men, they have more carbohydrates utilization. The women, they have more lipid utilization. So the men, they have higher catecholamines. The, low, the women, they have lower catecholamine level. The men, they have higher testosterone. The women have higher 17 beat estradiol. The men have less body fat percentage versus the women, they have greater body fat percentage. And then the last one is increased sweat rate and the women, they have decreased sweat rate. So let's talk about a little bit more on details on this. On this. So as we can see, uh, what differences we have in the, the fiber types. So the skeletal muscle is divided into two types of fiber. Slow twitch, this is type one, and the fast twitch, this is a type two. Slow twitch fibers are more efficient than the fast twitch fibers because they use oxygen to produce ATP, adenosine triphosphate, and the body primary energy source. This is the ideal in endurance exercises. The fast twitch fibers have 10 to 20% greater contractile force than type one fibers. The type two fibers are ideal for activity, activities requiring speed, such as sprinting, or high force movements, such as weightlifting. So the energy system that correspond with each muscle fiber types also differ while type one fibers predominantly use a mitochondrial respiration, type two fibers predominantly use glycolysis. When studying the rate of fatigue of each muscle fibers, type one fiber are more resistant to fatigue than type two fibers. Research has shown that the women have a higher proportion of type one skeletal muscle fibers and type two muscle fibers are more prevalent, prevalent than type one in men. So the differences found in a muscle fiber proportion between men and women most certainly 
contribute to varying performance capabilities. Studies show that the women have a greater resistance to skeletal muscle fatigue, while the men have a greater overall power output than women. The assumed me mechanism behind is that men have a higher proportion of type two muscles, muscle fibers relative to women. For a human body to perform any type of exercise, energy in the form of ATP is needed and manufactured by three systems. The phosphagen system, the glycolysis, and the mitochondrial respiration. These three energy systems utilize different forms of fuel, also known as substrates, and produce ATP through different chemical processes. The common substrates are phosphocreatine carbohydrates in the form of glucose or glycogen and lipids in the form of free fatty acids. The chemical processes for each of energy systems vary in complexity. The phosphagen system is the simplest chemical reaction and the quickest source of ATP. The glycolysis requires to use one of, or two molecules of ATP depending if the substrate or a glucose or glycogen and can yield two or three molecules of ATP. Also, the chemical reactions of glycolysis is not as quick as the phosphagen system and has an ATP cost. It is still a rapid source of energy. Uh, the mitochondrial respiration yields are greatest number of ATP molecules, but the rate of production is considerably slower than the phosphagen system or glycolysis. The mitochondrial respiration can utilize both lipids and carbohydrates as substrates. It means fuel sources. Mitochondrial respiration when using carbohydrates as a fuel source has a faster ATP production rate relative to when lipids are used as a fuel source. There are a number of key differences between men and women with respect to substrate utilization. For example, one study reported that the men had a 15 to 32% higher glycolytic enzymatic capacity when compared to men, which is low. The same study also find that the woman had a 15% higher capacity of beet oxidation, burning fat relative to men. Moreover, research has repeatedly shown that the woman demonstrate a five four to five percent lower respiratory exchange ratio than a man during the submaximal endurance exercise. So collectively, these findings demonstrate that the women are generally more reliant on lipids as a fuel source, whereas the men tend to be more dependent on carbohydrates as a substrate for metabolism. Two principal hormones upregulated in the body during the prolonged exercise are the catecholamines, the epinephrine and the norepinephrine, produced in the sympathetic nerve fibers and the adrenal medulla. These two hormones play a major role in oxygen and energetic substrate transportation to active skeletal muscles. Catecholamines have been shown to stimulate respiratory, cardiac, metabolic, and thermoregulatory functions. A sex is a key factor influencing epinephrine and norepinephrine concentrations at rest and during exercises. In a study observing plasma epinephrine concentrations in response to a set of 10 times six second sprints on a non-motorized treadmill, it was just found that there was nearly a three-fold greater concentration in men compared to women. 
Likewise, 25 to 50 percent higher higher epinephrine and non-epinephrine concentrations were found in the training matches men when compared to women during repeated six seconds supramaximal running boots. It's clear that the high capacity to secrete these hormones represent an advantage in competitive sports due to their role in regulating the skeletal muscle lycogenolosis. In fact, the greater catecholamine concentrations might be one possible explanation for the higher glycolytic capacity found in a man relative to women. Another key hormone that differs greatly in men and women is the estrogen sex hormone, that's a 17 beat estradiol. Indeed, women have significantly higher concentrations on 17 beat estradiol when compared to their men counterparts. During a woman menstrual cycle, 17 B estradiol concentrations will also fluctuate with lower levels occurring during a follicular phase and higher levels occurring during the luteal phase. Higher concentrations of 17 beat estradiol are positively correlated with increased lipid oxidation and concomitant sparing of a muscle glycogen. As stated above, lipid utilization regenerates ATP at a slower rate relative to carbohydrate oxidation. So in summary, men have higher catecholamine concentrations and lower levels of 17 beat estradiol, whereas women have a lower catecholamine concentrations and higher levels of 17 beat estradiol. Uh, sex differences in body composition and thermoregulation. This is an interesting part also. Why men and women typically shape differently? This can be attributed in part to the fact that men and women differ substantially and the concentrations of sex hormones, 7TB, estradiol, and testosterone. For example, women have a five-fold greater plasma concentration of 7TB, estradiol, while men have a nearly 15-fold higher plasma concentration of testosterone. In turn, it has been demonstrated that the testosterone levels are significantly correlated with the body composition values in men. In similar manner, 17 beat extradiol levels are significantly related to optimal abdominal obesity in women. Additionally, it's well known that on the average men have a lower body fat percentage when compared to women and that women typically store body fat peripherally and subcutaneously rather than around the abdominal region like men. The differences in body compositions and adipose tissue distributions underpin important sex-specific differences in the thermoregulatory capacity. Researchers find that men began to sweat at a core temperature at 30 6.9 Celsius, while women did not begin to sweat until significantly higher core temperature, 37.2. Additionally, researchers have observed men post-ovulation women and pre-ovulation women in a temperature control chamber for 90 minutes and measured the onset of sweating. It was reported that the men began to sweat at 14 minutes Post-ovulation women began to sweat at 17 minutes, and the pre-ovulation women began to sweat at 24. That is a big difference. In another study, subjects performed in 90 minutes indoor cycling boot, drank water ad libitum, and were measured for the rate and amount of sweat loss. It was found that the men had two-fold higher rate of sweat loss and two-fold greater overall magnitude of sweat loss when compared to women. In conclusion, men and women differ in the body composition, distribution of adipose tissue and thermoregulatory capacity.
create a personalized program for both male and female athletes. There are numerous details need to be considered when we start working with a training program, like gender, age, physical parameters, distance, specifications, training history, technical skills, and season periods. It's very important that, very important that you have an appreciation of sex-specific differences in a maximal cardiorespiratory and muscular fitness capacity and other key cardiometabolic risk factors, dissimilarities. Without this knowledge, you run the risk of establishing unrealistic goals for both male and female athletes. The primary difference is taking into account in the following. Compared to women, to men, women have a higher high density lipoprotein cholesterol levels on average 10 points. Compared to men, women have a lower blood pressure levels on average 10 milligrams. Relative to men, women have higher body fat percentage levels on average 5 to 8 percent. Relative to women, men have 10 to 20 percent higher cardio cardiorespiratory levels. And finally, relative to women, men have 30 to 50% greater upper and lower body strength measures, which is count a lot at the performance. <coughs> finally, some coaching thoughts about creating the right training programs. Uh, this is a per very personal thing from coach to coach, from situation to situation, from tradition to tradition. Uh, recovery in high intensity training is a vital component of overall exercises programs and paramount for performance and continued improvement. If the rate of recovery is suitable, higher training volumes and intensities are possible without detrimental effects of overtraining, which is one of the biggest danger. If you want to include high intensity training into the program, we must be aware that the competitor must be in a physical state close to the maximum. Otherwise, we will not achieve the desired efficiency. Let's say the athlete just getting more tired. In sprint kayak, canoe, in a high intensity training per recovery times are varying according to the distances. The Olympic program contains different distances from 200 to 1,000 meter time and time frame in 33 to 40 minutes at the men's. Such a light time differences require different preparation programs. So, of course, the recovery times will change accordingly. When the race distance are shortening, the numbers of strength and speed endurance exercises are increasing. So it's important that during the post-exercise time frame, the men will have a greater requirement of carbohydrates consumption to replenish depleted muscle glycogen stores. Relative to men, women utilize more lipids and less muscle glycogen during the submaximal exercises. One of the key elements of the planning is how many times per micro or macro cycle we are able to implement a high intensity, let's say race pace, 95, 100% intervals into the program with a proper fully recovery time. That also depends on, on the period, like if we are in the tapering period with men athletes, the ideal number is two, three times, maximum two, three times per week. Like in our experience, we used to have Tuesday, Thursday, and Saturday mornings. So there are at least three lower intensity or off sessions between the trials. That could be handleable. At women athletes, it is possible to increase this number up to four to five times per week of course, with a smaller amount of volume, according to their shorter distances from 200 to 500 meters within a time frame from 40 seconds up to one minute, 50 seconds maximum. 
men will likely require more rest between the high intensity interval trainings when compared to women. Also require more recovery time between the sets of resistant training compared to women. The female sex steroid hormones have multiply actions on body systems other than reproductive axis. Estrogen is known to affect the cardiovascular system, bone, and the brain. Progesterone primarily influences the thermoregulation and ventilation. Substrate metabolism is likely altered by both hormones. Net physiological effects can be either opposite or synergetic and are determined by the relative proportions of each. Investigations not consistently demonstrated a significant difference in aerobic anaerobic capacity, aerobic endurance, or muscle strength in any specific menstrual case. The course of some chronic diseases may vary slightly during the menstrual cycle phase, but the mechanism is currently unknown. During the long high volume lower intensity training the periods, the monotony tolerance of women are less compared to men, likely due to the mental differences. Finally, during our work, we have to take into the account that all women and men athletes are not machines. The input, the training, is not equivalent with the output results. There are millions of physical, mental, and other details are determining the preparation. In order to achieve the best possible results, we must learn the basic physical and biological mechanism to different methods and their effects. <coughs> In the same time, we also need to learn exactly the skills of our competitors in order to use the best personalized training methods in their preparation. This path will lead us to achieve to the desired results. Now, that is a long road, but worth it. Thank you for your attention. Thank you, uh, Zoltan. Uh, very, very interesting presentation. And uh, I think we had a lot of very interesting topics covered there uh, and a lot of questions are now coming in. Uh, if you would have got questions as a result of uh, this presentation, please go to the Q&A tab at the bottom of your screen. Don't put the questions in the chat. Um, please put them in the Q&A section there. And if you see a question there that already that you like, that you want asked, please just uh, just like it. And then we can, um, it, it, the more likes the question gets, the more chances it's going to get up to the top of the list. Uh, I should just mention, uh, quite a lot of people have asked a question, Zoltan, uh, regarding to what care should be taken during the women's monthly period. I know you covered that towards the end, but also I should just mention that in two weeks time, we have another webinar, which specifically uh, looks at um, considerations to be taken into account uh, during women's training or for women's training methods. But Zoltan, do you have any comments you want to make about? Um, uh, I, I, yeah. 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 I think, it, uh, uh, I think that that's a big story. I mean, it's, it takes, yeah lot of lot of things you have to consider but um, actually I don't feel myself as, as, a, as the best expert with this explanation and then as we as we know that in two weeks time there will be an expert who can go into into yeah, this I, I think to be safe uh, it may be best to uh, if people are available in two weeks time to, uh, yeah, to yeah. join that webinar. By the way, if you can't join that webinar, all our webinars are being recorded and will be available online within a couple of days. So um, you can go back and check any of the webinars that you miss or go back to uh, check out anything from today's presentation. 
if you just go to the canoeicf.com page um, and you'll be able to find those after. And you'll also find the, the list of webinars which are coming up. So there's some fascinating topics there. Um, so please do go in there and have a look. A uh, question from Alex uh, Zoltan. Uh, would the differences in thermoregulation influence hydration strategies across genders? Mm. I like your mm. point at the time. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, this is, yeah. No, no, I can see the questions. Yeah, okay. So would the differences in thermoregulation influence yeah. hydration strategies across genders? Mm, uh, I think it, it doesn't make a big differences. I mean, no, not much. Okay, simple answer. Simple, yeah. question, simple answer. Uh, question from uh, Madi. Uh, do, you, do you take into account the psychological aspects of competitors? Yes, yes, definitely. Yes, definitely. That's, that's one of the, the, the other parts over the physiological aspects that how much the, the athletes, like let's say the skills, the, the psychological skills also includes and uh, like let's say what we mentioned before like the the monotony tolerance for example mm -hmm. or what type of athletes like like uh, so it, it's it's a lot it's a lot of uh, it, it's complicated but of course the psychological aspects are are as important as as the physiological preparation definitely uh, and Zoltan, when it comes to the psychological aspects, uh, would you recommend that you leave it to the coach to analyze that or should you get in outside expertise? Because this is an area which sometimes coaches may not be adequately equipped to, to make those sorts of uh, yes. recommendations. Yeah, that's what I, when I think, it, like I'd say it's my experience. The coaches, they have to take care of million things. And of course, all these small million things are very important. And of course, the, the coach need to know, need to learn the athletes, physical and psychological skills. And of course, this is also depends on the level, which level are the athletes are, are standing. But for sure that the, the top, top level, I mean, the Olympic level is that the coach Physically, it's just too little to cover everything, especially if you're talking about like a single athlete or a team boat, a crew, two to four people. Then you should turn into the, uh, in, into the experts mm. because the experts, they have a good time and they have a good plan to, to taking care while the coach can, of course, receive the information and together the coach and the psychologists can work it out. What is the the best for the uh, for the athletes, and what is the like even can change the training loads from time to time, if some some questions coming up from the psychological side. So definitely, you should, we should turn into the experts. Yeah, yeah. Uh, question from Ivan: If we are working with female athletes who appear to have a higher percentage age type two fibers, for example, the top end 200 meter women, would we treat them more like the men in terms of workload and recovery times? Uh, oh, Ivan, yeah, I, yeah. I wouldn't treat them more like a man because then they would kill me. But, um, but uh, yes, uh, very close to that, very close to that, of course. Of course, there are the the two hundred meter specialists are are yeah they are like close to close to that uh, that level that they have much more fast switches and uh, but still need to take to to consider the uh, the recovery times and uh, the amount of the amount of uh, the volume of each training, let's say, that's what I said earlier, that while the men 
should have like three times a week the high top top intensity we can make it with uh, with a woman up to four to five times so that of course smaller portions of uh, of the vo of the total volume and the total top speed but it's yeah close to and uh, if let's say if we can get them close to to treating like a man they're going to be much better and much faster yes lots and lots of questions coming in uh if yeah, yeah. Just, if you're just joining us uh, the place to put your questions in is the q a tab on the bottom of your zoom screen uh, if you go down the questions and see one there that you would like answered, please just like that. And the more likes the question gets, the higher up the list it goes. A question from Christina Zoltan. Yes. Is the resistance to fatigue related to females utilizing increased beta oxid oxidation, beta oxidation? Also, when comparing women and men, do men have a lower resistance to fatigue due to their metabolic processes? or is this directly related to their increased power output? Yeah. Oh, uh, this is a, uh, yeah. I don't know if we have time for that, but uh, yeah, you know, this, this, uh, this lower resistance to fatigue things, is, it's not a, it's not a big difference. I mean, these are not huge differences, uh, but basically because they, the men, they have higher power output, they're using, let's say, much more energy. So uh, I think it's, uh, okay, I can see that the, the question has gone somewhere. I couldn't. Uh, yeah, hang on, I can get it back for you uh, one moment. Uh, yeah, here it is here. Is the resist, can you see that now? Is the resistance to fatigue related? Oh, no, 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 no. Is, is the resistance to fatigue related to females utilizing increased beta oxidization? Also, we're comparing women and men. Do men have a lower resistance to fatigue due to their metabolic processes? Or is this directly related to the increased power output? Yeah, yes. Yeah, I think so. Okay. Yes. Yeah. Good answer. Yes, right. Yeah. Uh, question from Kent. Yeah. Uh, how are your thoughts on how to manage the speed endurance sessions? Is it best with 48 hours of rest between? And how low should you go on the days in between? Um, let's say 48 hours, that's a, that's a two days. But that also depends on, on the level uh, of the athletes. So, I mean, the world-class athletes don't need that long recovery times. But if you say that there is a one day, like 100% race pace competi competition or because the competition is, is the worst part of this, uh, because that's really killing. After competitions, you should have like three days recovery time, mostly fully recovery time. Um, so let's say, as long as the athlete, athletes are, are well trained, then, then you need less recovery time. But let's say, if a world class athlete, you have like Tuesday morning, one top, top session, and then Tuesday afternoon, an easy, let's say 70, 60, 70% uh, high intensity within like, let's say 50 minutes, that can be 12 times four minutes or so. And then the next day, it's close to the same. So the third, um, third or the fourth session, uh, let's say 48 hours, yes, we can get back to the same high level. Um, so it's, it's varying, like if you have 100% and then the, the recovery trainings are, should be like 60 to 70%, not more than that. Yeah, that's it. Okay, good, good. Um, by the way, uh, just to let everyone know that there will be a survey sent out to all attendees today to give feedback so that we can uh, improve future presentations. So please, so when you get that, 
please take the time just to give us some feedback. Question from Campbell Zoltan. Uh, considering yeah. the onset of sweating in women occurs at a higher core temperature than men, how should we account for this when training in very hot environments? Yes, in these days there are, we are training in, in more and more hot environments. So, you know, just, just we have to take the, uh, you know, the intake. Uh, yeah, you know, uh, uh, just, just they have to drink a lot of liquids and uh but you know if there is a high pen temperature place or area uh we cannot take an account that we train less uh, less less than necessary but the uh, what we can compensate with the uh with the intake of, of liquids and minerals and electrolytes that's the only thing we can compensate. Nothing else. Okay, thanks, Sultan. Uh, uh, Giorgio asks: Is it possible to train men, men and women at the same time to a high level? Oh, what does it take the same time? Um, I mean, I'm assuming. Mm, you're training, yeah, training no, it, yeah, it's possible. It, it, I think it's possible because. Uh, I don't know. In, in my experience, I'm doing it in the same time. I have a men's team and, and uh, yeah, okay, I see Martin, the same training. No, it's not exactly the same training because that's determined by the distance. Let's say the, the women's training is, is depending on, on, the, on the 200 meters or 500 meters or team boat things while the men have the 200 to 1000 meter so they need a different kind of training methods and definitely physically they cannot train together on water because of the different speed um, so it, it must be a different training programs definitely and very much specific training program depending on on, on the distance they are just they are specialists on the distance yeah, uh, I've got a question here from uh, Farouk. Farouk asked a question in chat because uh, Farouk was unable to access the Q&A. Uh, Farouk wants to know, what is the best age to start strength training for both genders? And is it recommended to ask women's strength training during menstruation periods? Again, in two weeks time, we'll have a seminar specifically looking at, uh, at uh, training for women, but do you have a response to that, Zoltan? The best age to start strength training for both genders? Yes, uh, that is one of the key uh, question. When do you start uh, doing the strength training? Because as we know that that our sport, or at least my opinion, our sport is uh, one of the most complicated technical sport in the world. And then, uh, so the question is when you start to do the strength training as, as the, the short question is when you already have a, the right technique, uh, we used to say. So let's say in the preparation, uh, the first we have to teach the athletes to get the right technique. And that, that used to take a couple of years to establish a good technique. Uh, because the point is that when you start doing the strength training is that that like let's say there are different strength trainings there are one training which you, you do it with the uh, with the body weight like chin ups and push ups and everything that's recommended but let's say heavy weight training it it will just destroy the technique uh, because then you know we're growing muscle so the age of let's say 13, 14, 15, that's the exercises with the body weight, it's recommended. And then probably in the same age, you can stabilize the, the right technique for them. And then you can start to build up with light to the heavy weights. And then 
is like, let's say 15, 16 of age. Then you can start to build up. And then, but it, that can be also yeah, very dangerous to, to place it like too much waste training. Uh, in the experience is that too much strength training for use, both men, women, uh, will pay fast, good results, but later on, you have to pay it back because, uh, you know, that makes nice, good results, but you have to see the human body, how they're growing, and then, and then the kids are growing anyway and getting stronger, but too much strength training uh, takes back the, takes away the time from the more the technical and endurance things. And also you have to take, keep it into the account that the balance of the preparation is must be endurance, endurance, strength, technical. So this is the whole thing is in balance. And th the main question is how much is it takes from the strength training from, from the total. And it, it must be in balance. So, but I'm not recommending to start too early, definitely, because of the, of the technical issues. Yes. We have, a, we have about 10 minutes to go, so we'll try and get through as many questions as yeah. we can in that 10 minutes. Uh, quick question here from Anthony. To perform in 200 meters, what will be the key training on water between men and women? Uh, specifically time on and off during the series, rests and number of repetition. Yes. Uh, let's say 200 meters, it's specific something new. Um, uh, let's say the times, uh, we like in daily practice, we do a lot of, let's say the first thing stop starts. The, the start is the key of the 200 meters. If you are a good starter, then you are in a good position at once. If you lost, like, let's say a couple of meters and behind the leaders, then you're done. So it's really difficult to catch up. So but let's say we can start with the, with the starts, the stop starts, flying starts, and then we do 50 meters, 100 meters, 150, and finally 200 meters. This here, up to now, it's easy. The key is the recovery time. And as you, as you see, like for compared to the 1000 meter athletes or 500 meter athletes that they used to have like, let's say 1000 meter, three and a half minutes. We used to have like five to six minutes or maybe, maybe 10 minutes recovery time until the next one. While the 200 meters, we are giving like six minutes uh, or eight minutes up to the next one to manage to have the same high intensity and high speed training. So if we have like, let's say 200 meters, woman, 40 seconds, and then the next one is, is, is just after six minutes. So it's like, it's a huge difference, but because of the high speed, they need to, to recover, extremely recovering back to the normal, no lactate, they have to empty all the lactate things. And um, let's say yeah, it can be a minimum five times more than the distance, but it can be up to 10 times more than the distance or the, the total time. That means that, and the repetitions are not too much, but let's say five times or five times 200 meters within 40 minutes or so. And that's it. And they're not calculating with the warming up, cooling down periods. But basically, at the very beginning, when the 200 meters came into the, into the program, into the Olympic program, uh, a lot of people became very, very happy because they, they thought like, we're going to train less and then we're going to spend less hours in the water. And my experience was that if you really want to go on a high quality, uh, then it takes longer than the, than the thousand meter guys. It was a minimum two hours if you want to complete the whole training. So the, some people were disappointed. Mm -hmm. Yes. Um, Nicholas just 
just uh, checking the information you gave, you mentioned that men have a 20% greater capacity for aerobic capacity, but they have a lower percentage of slow twitch fibres relative to women. Nicholas checking, is that correct? And if so, is there a specific mechanism for this, Sultan? Yes. Yes, that you can find in, in, in a man's body. Yes. Um, yeah, so you know, a lot of lot of differences between men, women, are because basically because of the size. So the basically the, the average of men are like let's say 20, 30 percent bigger. The whole the, the whole body mass. So their capacity is of course higher than like if someone is like 80 kilo a man, and then you compare to the 60 kilogram weight for the woman. Of course, that's a big difference. So that maybe that makes a difference between, between, the, between the, the aerobe capacity also. So that's what I think. Okay. Uh, here's a um, little hornet's nest for you, Zoltan, if you care to put your hand in this nest uh, from John. While we acknowledge the binary differences between uh, physiological adaptations of men and women, what are your thoughts on the acceptance and participation of transgender athletes? And are there guidelines on this issue in the international scene? Oh. I thought you might react like that. Yeah. I have no idea. Let's see, this is something new for me. Yeah, I think it's new for everybody. Yes. Um, yes. And I can uh, say from an ICF perspective, I know that, that we've certainly been looking at it and wrestling with it. But I think we're all looking for guidance from the IOC on this area um, because it is very new for sports yes. and for coaches. I, I, I can't imagine, uh, it's open, I don't know if you had any experience in coaching a transgender athlete, but it's a difficult area for people who've not had any experience. In yes. Here. Yes. I don't have any experience. Yeah. I don't have any experience. So maybe, uh, probably it will take some time, um, to figure out the, the, exper the new experiences. Probably we have to have new experiences and then I, I don't, I, I used to read, uh, everything on the internet but I, I haven't seen any any materials on about the uh, about this case so I'm sorry I'm not, I'm no, not I, to the best of my knowledge I I don't think we've had any athletes any transgender athletes uh, at an international level at this stage some other sports have of course but, but canoeing hasn't but um, uh, that will obviously be something that will have to be dealt with once it once it happens, and it, I'm sure it will happen at some stage. Yes, yes. the world is moving. Yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah. Michelle asks, so uh, what care do you what cares do you take account when you prescribe a training program for women? Do you follow that question? Um, yes. Yes. Mm. Yeah, my, yeah, Michelle, this is a good question. <laughs> uh, I think I'm just taking taking into the account the uh, you know the all, all the all the same conditions as as the men. I mean, they are women, and then there are traditions. Let's say uh, the women's let's say training or the total amount. If you see weekly or monthly or kilometers, the women's are training about 20, 25% less than, than men into the same distance, of course. Uh, but basically all the rules, all the, uh, the training programs, all the effects are the same or, or a little different for, to men, to women. So if it's the endurance training, that's the endurance training for both. If it's a strength, it's a strength. So we're trying to make it like, let's say we have a test which is a distance specific test for let's say running uh if we have someone who's going for the thousand meter or going to the 200 meters that two different tests but basically on strength we do the same kind of exercises 
So mostly the exercises are the same in strength. Just the numbers of reps are making difference. And the, of course, the, the weights of the trainings. But as long as I'm coaching men, women together in the same time, uh, daily, uh, I don't take a, big, a huge difference between them. Just, just you know, looking for the specifics of women. Okay. Uh, Kieran asks, uh, you have spoken significantly in relation to sprint. What differences in strategies would you apply for distances from five kilometer to marathon? Okay. So that is endurance training. That, that's a typical endurance training. But of course, let's say a, a lot of um, in the history. Uh, no, I can see. Yeah. Okay. In the history, there were some of the sprint athletes could win a marathon race, even even uh, in world championships. Um, and now, okay, now I can see, I can see the, the question. You can spoke and see if you're to sprint, what differences in the strategies would you apply distance for 5K to marathon? Or the, the strategies would you apply? But this is like, a, this is like a, a race strategies or a physical preparation yeah. strategies. That, that's, it's not clear for me. Um, let's say that's okay. I continue then. Uh, that was in the history. There was some good sprint athlete, uh, athletes could win the marathon race because they they had a, a kind of high le high level of endurance, but the benefit was they they had a much higher top speed and speed, so they could hang in on on washes and and could win a marathon race. Let's say easily. So it's not clear for me that what what is the relation, what is the difference, because it could be training plan or race plan or whatever. Sorry. That's okay. Um, Kieran, I'm not sure if we'll get a chance to come back to that, but if you want, if you have more information. Yeah. Um, and just quickly, Alessandro had asked, um, you quoted a lot of facts and figures and is there any way we can let's afterwards put up the source of all your information where it all comes from? You don't need to detail it all now, obviously, but can you provide that later for some of your facts and figures which you quoted? Yeah, yes, let's say let's each... no need to do it now, but we can we can later yes. if you provide the details of the sources. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. But that's that's uh, that's at the the references. Yeah, if you see, good. if you go going down, there's a, there are a lot of addresses for, uh, as as references. Yep. Yep. Yes. Of course. Antonio asks, uh, as a paddling technician, passionate passionate technician, yep. uh, I'd like to know Zoltan's opinion regarding uh, technical skills on the following topic: between a man and a woman, who is the most skilled, or who is the most available? and disciplined and focused in details in order to improve a paddling technician? Oh. Does that make sense to you? Uh, but was it like who is like both, both women are, um, you know, the, the technical skills are, are, are personal. And uh, I had I had a good experience of coaching good technicians, men, women. So, but the, like the most, the men or the woman who is skilled, both they are skilled, but just they have to have the they have to have a talent to be a good technicians. And of course, uh, if they are coming from the uh, from the uh, the place or the club or the country, but they have good traditions of uh, teaching technique. Uh, they are lucky, uh, but it, it's it, because this is a very, very special technique. What we have, kayak, canoe is even more. Um, so it must be like, you know, 
you must have inherited skills to be a good paddler. And uh, it's maybe it's too rough to say, but the real, the real good paddlers in, in my eye is they are like, that's maybe 10% of the population, kayak population, who can really do kayaking. So the, the rest are just improvising or trying to do something. But, um, but that's, the technique is the key, you know, the technique is the key of everything in our sports. So you can be strong enough, you can have, you can improve your, your um, uh, endurance level, speed endurance level. You can train, you know, 50 hours a week. But if you cannot put into everything, into the, the right technical solution, it's done. So if you see the, the winners of the last Olympics World Championships, uh, they were always the best technicians could win. There are a lot of strong guys and girls, uh, but always the best technicians are winning. So that's, the, that's in the history. Yes. Uh, I think we'll wrap it up there, Zoltan. We've, we've uh, had an hour of presentation and questions. I apologise to those people who have sent questions through that had answers, but I think we've covered a lot of ground today. Zoltan and Bako, thank you so much for taking some time, an hour out of the Copenhagen sunshine to spend yes. with us.